In this Great Lakes prepping video, I want to talk about the common food preservation methods. Uh, I use all of these to some extent, definitely some a lot more than others. Um, but if you're not entirely familiar with the different um, ways in which you can make your food last longer, uh, I, I sort of broke them down and um, I'll mention a few things about each one as far as uh, resources needed and uh, um, approximate range of storage for that method. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, the first and probably the most common among pretty much everybody these days is freezing. Uh, there's not a lot of explanation needed um, to talk about freezing food. You freeze it, it lasts longer. Um, you're uh, preserving it basically uh, by lowering the temperature and making it uh, mostly impossible for things like bacteria to grow in it. Um, generally, I would consider this a medium to long storage um, option, uh, maybe around six to 12 months for something like meat. Obviously, it will last longer than 12 months. It'll probably still be safe to eat, but uh, you begin to lose um, some of the texture, some of the flavor, some of the nutritional value. Um, now freezing, of course, requires uh, a large, constant amount of electricity. Um, in terms of uh, prepping and, and things like that, um, lots of electricity constantly is something that we tend not to um, consider reliable. Uh, if, if the grid goes down or if, if anything goes down, uh, it's going to take a lot of resources to run a freezer. Um, now, I mentioned there's uh, some impact to texture and taste. If you freeze meat and then thaw it out, it's going to be pretty close to when it was fresh. But when you freeze certain vegetables, fruits, um, certain other things, it's going to change the, the texture. If you, you can't freeze a tomato and then expect that it's still going to be just like a fresh tomato when you thaw it out. Um, there's minimal impact to nutritional value. Everything's sort of frozen in, uh, in the, just about the state that it was in, um, uh, before you froze it. Uh, now I also mention a, a, um, uh, a cost range for each of these methods. And that's generally the, the price you would need to spend to, um, get started using this preservation method. Well, pretty much everybody has a fridge with a freezer in it. Um, if you wanted to freeze on a larger scale, you'd probably need something like a chest freezer. And a chest freezer runs uh, anywhere between $200 and $700 and, and up, depending on the size you want and the brand and the quality. So that's freezing. Uh, second, canning. Uh, canning, um, really simplified, involves using heat to seal foods in liquid. Um, this can include hot water bath canning or pressure canning. I believe there's also a method called steam canning that I've never personally uh, dealt with. Um, this would generally have a medium to long storage time, again, about 6 to 12 months. Uh, I wouldn't keep something that I canned for longer than about 12 months. Um, if we're talking uh, hot water bath canning, that's low acid foods, uh, sorry, high acid foods for hot water bath canning, such as tomato sauces, um, certain fruits, things like that. Uh, pressure canning you can use for much more things, meats, other vegetables, uh, all sorts of things. Um, the resources required for canning is a lot of heat one time. It takes a lot of heat to heat the water um, for long enough to, to can these things. Uh, but you only have to do it once and you don't need electricity, you can use any kind of heat as long as it will um, get water boiling. Um, there's some impact to texture and taste. Uh, there's some impact to nutritional value. And to get started, depending on what kind of canning you want to do, you could expect to spend anywhere from $100 to about $600 um, on the equipment, um, the, the, the jars, uh, all the little gadgets you need. Obviously, if you're pressure canning, you need a more expensive piece of equipment than if you're just hot water bath canning. Next is dehydrating. 
Now this is using heat and air to remove moisture from your food, thereby uh, allowing it to last longer. Um, this could be long to very long storage time, um, five to 20 years, depending on what you're dehydrating. Uh, there's a lot of vegetables that I've dehydrated that I'm comfortable leaving sealed uh, for between 10 and 20 years. Um, this requires a moderate amount of electricity initially. There's ways to dehydrate in an oven or something like that, but I'm generally talking about using an electric dehydrator. Uh, there is moderate impact to texture and taste, as well as uh, nutritional value. When you dry foods out, um, you're, you're, you're going to remove some of the, the vitamin um, value from it. Um, texture and taste, uh, you dehydrate a vegetable, you can rehydrate it for the most part. Uh, a lot of vegetables, it's not going to be exactly the way it was when it was fresh. It'll be a little bit different. It'll still be good, but it won't be quite the same as fresh or even frozen. Um, a dehydrator, depending on the size and the brand and the quality you get, can run you anywhere between $50 and $500 or more. Um, and uh, kind of the, 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 the big brother of dehydrating is the next one, freeze drying. Uh, freeze drying is also removing all the moisture from food, but instead of using uh, heat and air, you're using a process called sublimation. Now this is using um, uh, freezing combined with a, the, a vacuum to turn uh, ice crystals directly into uh, gas, evaporating them directly from ice. You're skipping that liquid step. That's what sublimation means. And in doing this, you can preserve the texture and the taste and the nutritional value very well. Um, if you dehydrate a ice cream sandwich, you're going to melt all the ice cream and you're going to have a great big mess and no ice cream left. You'll pretty much have a bunch of sticky crap all over your dehydrator and maybe a couple of uh, brown cracker looking things. If you freeze dry an ice cream sandwich, what you end up with is something that looks exactly like an ice cream sandwich. Uh, it's just, it'll be very light and brittle and we'll have more of the consistency of that. Uh, I don't know if you ever got any of that, uh, space ice cream that they used to sell. Uh, I use this example because I've seen it done in a video and I was pretty impressed that, that that thing looked exactly like an ice cream sandwich. Same goes for meats, uh, vegetables, fruit, uh, freeze drying it. It's going to look almost exactly the way it did before you freeze dried it. And when you reconstitute it with water, not even reconstitute, just rehydrate, um, meats will be very close to how they were beforehand. Um, all of the mountain house foods, a lot of the, uh, the, the survival food you buy, it's freeze dried because um, it, it's the best quality food. Uh, it's the best quality you can get for removing all the moisture out of it. Um, you can store freeze-dried food for a very long time, um, 15 to 30 years. Um, most of the mountain house food um, claims that it can be stored for 25 to 30 years. Now I'll mention some of that is because of the way it's packaged. It's freeze-dried and then sealed in a, in a particular way that allows it to last very long. Um, the obvious drawbacks to freeze-drying is the expense. Uh, and the resources. It requires a very large amount of electricity for the freeze drying process. Obviously you only have to do that once, um, but it, it's, a, it's a lot of electricity because you're running a heavy duty freezing element and a vacuum element, a vacuum pump rather. Uh, the, uh, these machines can cost anywhere between $2,000 and $12,000 for the kind of machine that you could fit in your home. Uh, they make sort of uh, home versions of freeze dryers for around $2,000 for the smallest one. And it doesn't hold a lot of uh, food at any given time, so you'll have to run it a lot to store up a lot of food. A lot of those machines also require uh, routine maintenance. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. They, they may need to be calibrated or, or the oil change, that kind of thing. They're heavy-duty machines. Um, they're expensive and they use a lot of resources. 
uh, for for me, in my opinion, I found it more cost effective to purchase already freeze dried foods. And that's why some of those freeze dried foods can cost so much because a lot of resources need to go into that. Um, but for me, um, as much as uh, food preservation as I do in other ways, um, freeze drying, um, I found it to be more beneficial cost wise to just purchase already freeze dried foods. But um, your opinions may differ on that. Um, the, the last three I'll mention are curing, smoking, and pickling. And uh, these only really work for certain foods. Um, you know, uh, there's a significant impact to texture and taste and moderate to high impact to nutritional taste. Um, the reason for this is, is it, it generally involves using um, salt or smoke or vinegar uh, to preserve it. And those things are going to change the taste and nutritional value a lot. Um, so we'll talk about curing and smoking. Um, curing is using salt to leach moisture out of meats. Smoking is using smoke to leach moisture out of the meats. Um, pickling is basically increasing the acid content of a food, thereby making it uh, uh, preservable. Um, for curing and smoking, uh, very long-term storage, you're still going to need to uh, refrigerate or freeze. Um, there's ways to cure and smoke meats to where they can last on the shelf for, for quite some time. Um, but I'm a little apprehensive about using those methods myself. Um, I think there's always sort of an inherent risk of um, foodborne illness when you do it that way. I know people have been doing that for thousands of years. Uh, but I, I think a lot of that was out of necessity. That's all they had. Um, I think there's better options for myself personally. Plus, I don't want to eat a ton of salt, so I'd rather not cure meat. Um, pickling, uh, that obviously works with anything that you can um, soak in vinegar. Uh, a lot of stuff, though, you wouldn't want to. I know you can have pickled eggs and pickled pig's feet and all that stuff. I'm not interested. I'm pretty much going to stick with things like pickled cucumbers and a, a couple of other vegetables, maybe onions, maybe beets, um, jalapenos, other peppers. Sure, why not? Um, now, I'll mention that uh, with pickling, if you want it to be shelf-stable, uh, canning is still a necessary step. So pickling is kind of... Uh, uh, grouped into the canning method. It's just uh, sort of a different kind of canning. You're canning something in a vinegar uh, liquid rather than uh, tomato sauce or, or what have you. Um, but pickling, again, it's a method that's been used for, for a very, very long time. And uh, it works pretty well for certain foods. And same with curing and smoking. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's my quick rundown. Uh, freezing, canning, dehydrating, freeze drying, curing, smoking, and pickling. I know there's a few others. There's fermenting, which I'm not even going to get into because it doesn't interest me. I don't want to eat uh, sauerkraut every day or, or pretty much ever, so I'm not going to uh, even really dabble in that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I know I touched on them all just very briefly. Um, but there's a lot of information out there if you want to learn more about any one of these. I think I might also do a video pretty soon here. Um, I get a lot of questions on the channel about um, food preservation, especially the, the kinds of food preservation that I show in the videos I make. Um, I get a lot of questions in the comments about, about things. So I was thinking about making another video uh, answering some of those questions, some of the more common ones. So that'll probably be an upcoming video uh, that I'll make pretty soon. And um, there may be even follow-ups to that video as I get more questions. So uh, I guess that's it for now. Um, until next time, this is Great Lakes Prepping.